This next question um, addresses pretty much the same issue, but it, it raises some, some other points as well. Um, so you can choose to deal with it as you wish then. It's a long question. Um, <laughs> It's like an apology. Uh, he says, Mr. LaRouche, you repeatedly talk about a science-driven, high-tech approach to economic recovery and economic reconstruction. Now, we've looked very closely at the FDR model, and it's, it appears, they say, that the first phase of FDR's recovery program was not necessarily science-driven. However, it did take people who had suffered long-term unemployment and it put them to work at what were admittedly labor-intensive but, but nevertheless productive jobs. And the result of that was a significant increase in the nation's infrastructure and in both the economic and cultural standard of living of the general population. Without that increase, we may not have been capable of the subsequent buildup that allowed us to win the Second World War. Now that buildup, they say, was science driven. And it was FDR's clear intention to take that great war machine and to use it in the post-war period, not only to rebuild war-torn nations, but also to address the enforced backwardness of nations that had been victimized by colonial policy. Now, for current purposes, take a look, for instance, at the continent of Africa. Africa is a total catastrophe in all terms of, of the most basic infrastructure but also in terms of the, the immediate capability of the population. Electrifying an entire continent will take a great deal of time. In the interim period, especially since with really very few exceptions, which we're willing to note, we're dealing with largely agricultural economies. And it would seem that the utilization of alternate sources of energy production, especially in the sub-Saharan region, would provide a viable interim alternative to, for instance, the construction of, of nuclear plants in the middle of the wilderness. Can you, can you help us to understand why you see a problem here? It seems to be something that FDR, in a, admittedly in a different way, was also forced to address. Well, I think these are, your treasure has, has filled out. Well, actually, there's some misstatement of what FDR did, because you have to look at things in a more longer term. The you have two tendencies in the United States with the assassination of McKinley. McKinley was a patriot. Theodore Roosevelt was a traitor. Uh, and things like that. And uh, Coolidge was no damn good, and Hoover was no damn good. So you have to look at things a little bit differently than just trying to pick at something and interpreting it by, in isolation. Because an economy is a... Well, but the term is dynamics. And the way you're phrasing the argument, as some of the other arguments here, you're talking in Cartesian terms, Cartesian reductionist terms. And no process operates, actually, in terms of Cartesian terms. Any representation using Cartesian models, in other words, assuming little things floating around in empty space, that sort of thing, is nonsense. What determines the, the processes in history are not in, as simple me mechanical interactions. They're long-term processes, which they're like universal physical principles, which shape the course of events. 
And the product is not determined by the local interaction, it's by the process which shapes the process of events. It's called dynamics. Dynamics was uh, known to civilization in the ancient pre-Aristotle period. Huh? It was the basis of what was called spherics, which was the science of the Egyptians. It became the, sci the science of, uh, essentially of the Pythagoreans and Plato and so forth. Huh? These are dynamics. In other words, there is a universal principle which you appeal to and you act in detail according to the governance of that principle. It's the Einstein connection of the universe, of a universe which is finite but has no external bounds because it's self-bounded. Therefore, the principle of action and development uh, controls the behavior of the part. And you're acting on the part to ensure that the action corresponds to that intention. So you have to look at a longer term process. Now, in this case, the United States has been contested territory since its inception. It was before its inception. In 1763, there was a fundamental division within the political processes of, the United, of what became the United States. Between, on the one hand, the pigs of the British East India Company, right? like Judge Lowell up in Massachusetts, which and also our earlier Aaron Burr uh, in, in the same period later. Aaron Burr was a traitor. Aaron Burr, Aaron Burr, the vice president of the United States at one point, was an agent of the British East India Company. He was a traitor to the United States. Andrew Jackson was a traitor to the United States who worked for Burr, and so forth and so on. So in this process, you had the tendency of a patriotic tendency, which had a certain principle of action, and a contrary interest of another type, the pro-British side. And Andy Jackson was a traitor. He worked to destroy the United States under Burr. In an operation, you ask about the, what happened to some of the Indians because of Andy Jackson down in uh, Georgia and so forth, the Cherokee. What happened to the nation? It was broke, broken up. How? Huh? And for what purpose? All right, so... Uh, in this case, the, we knew, despite the fact that Wilson had been president, he was a traitor and a fascist, despite the fact that Theodore Roosevelt, who was a traitor, was a president, and became president by virtue of the killing by a foreign agent of President McKinley. Despite these things, through the military and other institutions of the United States, we maintained a capability and intellectual capability and skills which correspond to the true interests of the United States. For example, there was a negotiation in the early 1920s